Kanshna, thank you for your introduction. So I'm Omidu, as Kanshna mentioned. Uh, I've been here with WSURU for 10 years. Uh, my main bread and butter is IAM, but I had a brief stint at Corio leading the IAM effort. Uh, so that's why, where I actually got to work very closely with the Corio platform and got to experience the, the thing that we have built here. Uh, so uh, today, um, I'm, uh, I'm, go I'm going to go through on how you can fast track your uh, cloud native application journey with Corio and how you can boost your developer productivity by utilizing various capabilities, features, and best practices we have embedded into the Corio platform. So uh, anyone who has not heard the term cloud native, I'm pretty sure uh, this is not a new term. Um, so this has been around for, uh, for the past decade or so. It's not a new term. Uh, so if I get a random sample out of uh, here uh, from this audience, I'm sure you're doing um, some form of cloud native application development within your business or within your company. Um, so, so today's organization are sort of rapidly adopting cloud native practices because they have uh, seen or heard or experienced in some form of the benefits that the cloud native uh, application or adapting cloud nativeness brings to their business. Um, so some numbers. Uh, just to like convey the scale of this, uh, this is something uh, Gartner published uh, mid last year. So they expect, uh, expect by the end of year 2024, by end of this year, uh, the global expenditure on cloud native market, so cloud market, cloud infrastructure, as well as cloud services, uh, to reach around $725 billion. So this was around uh, $600 billion uh, last year, at the end of last year. So the consumption of cloud services, uh, cloud infrastructure, has proliferated. Uh, so due to uh, various reasons, uh, predominantly on the cost effectiveness, the agility, uh, the resilience and the scalability and how businesses can uh, quickly adapt to the growing market needs, uh, companies are more and more adapting cloud native strategies into their business. But all of this good stuff, it comes with the fact that you are doing uh, or approaching the cl cloud native in the correct way. Uh, so it's true that there's rap rapid adoption. Then I was wondering, uh, even though there's a lot of adoption, what sort of a percentage of the companies are getting the most out of going cloud native? So uh, while do, uh, digging through the internet to like, uh, find out uh, how companies have succeeded or not succeeded adopting cloud native, I came across an interesting uh, survey, which was done uh, a couple of months back by uh, Foundry and USD in collaboration. Um, so what they have done was they surveyed 100 large-scale enterprises uh, to understand where they are in terms of their cloud native journey, whether they are adopting cloud nativeness to their business, or whether they are getting the most out of adopting cloud native. So uh, not so surprisingly, uh, about 82% of those businesses uh, are doing some sort of cloud native development within their organization. But this um, survey came with a lot more interesting facts uh, than I anticipated to see in, a, in, in this report. Uh, so 95% of these companies mentioned uh, they are having some sort of road blockers adopting cloud native effectively and getting the most out of uh, uh, adapting cloud native strategies in their business. So some of the reasons that they have mentioned, they are having difficulties on training or educating their difficult, uh, the development teams. And um, the, there, are, there are complexities on automating their deployments, uh, testing, uh, and monitoring, troubleshooting their systems because of the way they, have, they are going about cloud native approach. And uh, some of these companies are having a hard time finding skills that is required or required to implement a cloud native strategy within their company. So uh, apart from these kind of uh, information, uh, these kind of limitations, they have also mentioned that uh, due to the left shiftness of uh, cloud native adoptions, spe specifically uh, the security testing aspect 
more comes towards uh, developer side of things. Uh, it, it, it gets affected in a de de at the development time. So, uh, due to the, uh, the left shiftness, uh, left shiftness of, of cloud native adoption, they are also finding some uh, some difficulties on cloud native adoption. So, surprisingly, so 97% of these companies are trying to seek external help implementing uh, their cloud native uh, platforms or cloud native application development. So, uh, just, just to get some perspective on uh, what it means to develop for the cloud, I just came up with a very simple abstraction um, on starting a, a piece of code starting from your laptop or starting from your developer machine, ending up all the way in a production server. So what's the typical journey look like? So you have something in your code, and uh, nowadays you will commit it to a source code repository, be it GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, you name it. So then uh, once you do that, what often happens is you will have your CI system, uh, which, uh, get, which identified, OK, there's some change in the code repository, and it starts to pull your source and start building the source, creating binaries, and then uh, it ends up in uh, generating some sort of a container. Uh, so then there will be some security scans uh, to make sure that you are not shipping unsecure code to your production or production environments. Uh, so once that is done, then your CD system gets triggered. Uh, so where you pull the, the container out of the container registry and deploy into a, typically to a low environment, uh, where your developers and QAs are going to do, uh, run a bunch of tests. Uh, this is where your E2E tests as well as um, scenario tests are getting executed. So once everything are in place, uh, then that is getting promoted to a high environment. So this deploy, test, and promote cycle goes on until uh, it reaches the production. So once your code is in the production, you start observing it to make sure that it's working as expected. It's not, uh, it's not malfunctioning, or if there's bugs, or if you need improvements in this, you go through all the cycle. However, this is not the, these are not the only things that you require to run something in a production-ready manner in the cloud. So there's a um, wide range of capabilities that you have to build into your system in order to run an effective production system. Right? So this is, some of these are due to the uh, de 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 developing on top of cloud-native approach, and some are common to uh, other development practices as well. But the point is, uh, you, you, have, you, you, you need to have a platform which can effectively support these capabilities uh, and to make sure that you run your system in an optimum way. So having a solid platform is key here. OK. All right. So the facts, uh, the facts look like um, developing software for the cloud it doesn't seem like a very easy task. There's a lot of things that need to happen correctly, a lot of systems that need to be implemented in order to get this run correctly. So uh, unless you get this, uh, this correct, if you approach in a correct way, you will not be able to get the most out of these benefit, benefits I have mentioned in the previous side of adopting a cloud-native strategy to your business. So in comes Corio, uh, our very own internal development platform. So we designed and developed Corio, having all these complexities, requirements in mind, so the developers can spend their valuable time on building the actual business requirement rather than uh, focusing on the platform. So let's have, some of, let's have a look at some of the capabilities that Corio brings, which can uh, fast track uh, the developer journey or the getting your piece of code to the cloud in the shortest possible time. So uh, let's, let's go back to my uh, earlier workflow where getting your piece of code deploying to, deployed into the production. So just imagine the number of things that you need to have in your platform in order to support something like this. So first, you need a CI CD system, and you need to write some pipeline code to make sure that uh, you pull the source, build the source, build images, then you need some sort of a security tool to do the scanning. 
and you need to have a, another set of pipelines which do the de de uh, continuous de de deployment. And uh, if, since you are developing or deploying into a Kubernetes environment, you will have to end up in writing a Kubernetes artifact. And so in some cases, maybe if you have to provision infrastructure, you will have to, again, utilize something uh, like uh, Terraform or something to write infrastructure as code. So there's a whole bunch of systems uh, that needs to be in line in your system in order to get a single piece of code deployed into production. So but Corio, so we understand all these requirements and complexities. And if you're, when you're using the Corio, you only have to build, uh, bring in your source. You just plug it with our system. We do all the building images, security scanning, deploy to ro uh, deploy, uh, developing or right, generating the Kubernetes artifacts, and deploy, deploying it to an environments within a matter of clicks. So uh, moving on. So when we talk about deployments, we cannot forget about environments, right? So any responsible software engineers, you test your stuff in a low environment. So I'll try to make sure that uh, you don't run into a situation that it works on my machine sort of situation. So, um, so the typical or the best practice is you promote through a bunch of environments uh, and make sure everything is uh, functioning as expected before ending up uh, that your fe features or functionalities in the cloud. So Corio, we treat environments as a first-class citizen. It was designed, the workflows and the uh, workflows are designed uh, considering this requirement. So we have drastically simplified how environments are, are created. Uh, you, you get a lot of flexibility how, how to, on creating environments. So if you want to have a sort of a multi-cloud, even uh, you, have to have, you, you want to have environments running lo locally in your local setups, we facilitate uh, that sort of capability through environment creation capabilities of Corio. So there's a lot of flexibility. And you don't need to write an uh, extensive amount of infra as a code to provision resources uh, and uh, make, uh, to make sure it's done in a repetitive or a programmatic manner. So all these complexities are handled through Corio. So you just have to do uh, several clicks to get a new environment provision. Right. So scaling. Uh, so scaling is a crucial aspect of any the cloud native development, right? So your, your business system or your application needs to have the capability to scale based on the demand uh, and make sure your critical systems are running regardless of the amount of requests uh, that is hitting in your, to your application. Um, so Corio uh, have a very simplified set of ways of de defining scaling policies. Um, so you can, uh, based on the uh, resource, resource utilization, you can specify how the scaling should be done. So you can scale up, scale down, and more importantly, Cori also supports scale to zero capabilities, where when you don't have any traffic at all, uh, we can scale down uh, in, a, in a way that it will not consume many resources. Effectively, this, this will optimize resource utilization and save costs as well. So uh, you don't have to, again, like within a number of clicks, you can get this done. It's pretty straightforward stuff. OK, so observability. So uh, when you're doing cloud native application development, so you're adhering to a microservice, uh, microservice architecture. This means essentially your system could end up with tens and hundreds of microservices. Just imagine, um, uh, so having to troubleshoot an issue when you have hundreds of micro microservices, so typically, um, these are loosely coupled, so uh, to serve one request from a client, that request might go through a number, uh, uh, number of microservices until the end result is produced. So in such an environment, troubleshooting is going to be a pretty much nightmare if you don't have a good observability system in, in place. So Corio provides a very sophisticated set of capabilities to observe your deployment, so um, you get views on throughput and latencies, as well as you get the ability to have aggregated view of your uh, lo uh, logs, uh, not just focusing on a single component. So you can drill down to a, up to a single component as well. But you can have a step back and see uh, what went wrong in your overall system and identify and troubleshoot. 
and uh, fix your issues faster with Corio. And we also have some um, um, set of diagnostic capabilities as well, where we correlate with correlate the errors with um, your throughput latency along with uh, CPU usage and memory usage as well. So uh, we are making very convenient for you to troubleshoot your problems with the observability capabilities we have within Corio. OK. Uh, discover and reuse. So th this is uh, what sort of Tishan was talking about uh, in his uh, session. So uh, often your business or your company works in a team environment. There will be a set of teams who works on uh, utility APIs. Uh, there will be another set of uh, teams who are working on domain-specific APIs. So then there will be another set of teams which will be consuming all these things. So. As a, uh, so your platform, if you have a way of effectively uh, communicate or effectively uh, put out the services uh, you have internally in your system, so you, if you have a well-defined catalog within your system uh, for your other developers to come and consume and reuse these capabilities, that's going to be a, a very uh, it'll, it'll, it's going to help your developers a lot in terms of doing development. So I think uh, Tishan uh, went uh, to details on how these capabilities are in Corio. So basically, this is on the internal marketplace we readily make available for the developers to discover APIs within the system. Right. Uh, so API management. So uh, microservices, again, uh, these are loosely coupled. You do a lot of... Uh, invocations or communication between uh, API uh, microservices through APIs, right? So you end up with a lot of APIs. At the same time, that means you need to effectively manage it. So Corio has a rich set of API management capabilities. So starting from API lifecycle management, so you can define lifecycle from creation to uh, publishing state to uh, retirement or uh, deprecation. So all these uh, lifecycle management capabilities are there. API security, again, a critical thing, if you're especially if you're, regardless of whether you're, whether you're exposing your APIs to an internal audience or an external audience, API security is critical, so you support a variety of methods of securing, securing your APIs. Rate limiting, uh, protecting your APIs against misuse or attacks, uh, it's crucial. So rate limiting capabilities are a must. Uh, versioning, so I'll drill down on this a bit later, as well as analytics. So network visibility, again, uh, so you will have different types of APIs within your organization. Some will is intended only for an internal audience. Maybe it, it, it should be confined to your project, right? And it's not supposed to be consumed by other consumers of your organization or external parties. So there could be some other APIs which is only intended for your, your organization only, but not for the external, external consumers. And there will be APIs that will uh, specifically written and exposed for the consumption of third party users. So uh, having, uh, so being able to um, specify correct level of network visibility is something we support out of uh, Corio API management capabilities. Then if you're planning to, again, to expose your APIs to a third party, you need an external marketplace. So through the developer portal in Corio, we can facilitate these kind of capabilities as well. OK. Uh, version control. Uh, so, uh, so having API means you will have to modify these APIs, improve these APIs at some point, and you have to do it in a way, and you must make sure that you don't create chaos while doing or oh, updating something in the API, right? So you need some level of some sort of versioning in your uh, platform so you can effectively uh, maintain or expose different versions of your API. In a way, it will it will not affect the rest of the system uh, system uh, or other clients. And so we do have intelligent routing capabilities as well. So let's say you are doing um, incremental improvements to your API. Uh, doing uh, typically like so, if you are following a semantic versioning, so we do follow following follow semantic versioning. So for the APIs, let's say you have v1, v1.1, v1.2, and so on. So every time you make a modification to an API, if you have to go and change the client, it's 
it, it, you are going to meet with a lot of friction, uh, even uh, in your internal ecosystem as well. So uh, what intelligent routing do is like you stick to one major version, but we make sure internally we navigate to the latest and the greatest version of this API, so, so your client does, clients does not have to uh, keep updating the client-side code in order to uh, make the most out of, uh, so or right, keep compliance with the modifications of the API. Uh, insights, uh, again, uh, so having a view on the usage of your APIs is also critical. So we have a rich set of uh, analytics capabilities exposed to Corio. So you, it allows you to monitor traffic patterns, errors, latencies, as well as uh, generate usage reports and uh, set up alertings to track any anomalies. So these, all these things are in, built into the Corio platform, so you don't have to um, consume a third-party service or integrate with the third-party services to get uh, insights on the uh, APIs that you expose through your system. Uh, manage databases and caches. So again, uh, any any serious kind of applications are, are going to end up requiring some level of storage capability. So uh, out of the box, we have support a range of database types and flavors, and you have the flexibility to deploy wherever you want. Any major, uh, so most of the major vendors are supported for you to go and create these uh, database systems. So uh, what it means for a developer is you don't have to really wait for your DBA to go and create uh, the database for you and wait for uh, wait that your infrastructure is getting provisioned. So you can just go to the uh, within the Corio platform itself. You will be able to uh, create databases and con uh, consume it in your application. So we take care of HA and auto backups. So you don't have to worry about managing these databases. So. End user authentication. So I know, like, if you are doing an application, a consumer facing application, or even an internal facing application, authentication is going to be a key requirement. Uh, so, um, so let, for example, if we take a developing SPA or developing SPA or may, um, implementing authentication capabilities to a single, provide, single page application, that means if you are not a very security savvy person, you have to understand a lot of nitty gritties of uh, implementing authentication in a secure way. So often uh, modern applications use uh, specifications like OAuth and OpenID Connect protocols, um, which require some, I have to say, you need some level of knowledge on these protocols uh, at, to implement this. So, uh, and this comes with some complexities on securely handling tokens and make sure you are not exposing uh, your tokens outside because it's a client-side application. You don't have a lot of. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, these uh, tokens are stored in a secure way. Then you have to do session management, session refreshing, uh, handling logout, all those things. Uh, if you are not a very security-savvy person, it's going to. Uh, you will feel like it's a burden. So, with having that in mind, we have this manage auth capability in Corio, where we expose a dedicated backend for your front-end application. So each of your application, uh, front-end applications, SPS, will, have, will get its own backend, which is specifically capable of handling uh, authentication and authorization on behalf of the application. So the backend will go and communicate with uh, the identity providers and uh, do the OAuth handshakes, get the tokens, uh, securely store the tokens. So uh, developers don't have to do any of these uh, protocol specific stuff and focus on uh, simply integrating authentication capabilities to the application. So we have taken uh, one more step ahead with this managed authentication capabilities. We have uh, introduced some simple uh, user management and authorization capabilities. So within the platform itself, you, you can uh, test an end to end scenario with authentication and authorization capabilities. So you technically do not have to wait until uh, you, get, uh, you, you, you get access to a third party IDP, so get keys generated, etc. Within the scope of the Corio platform itself, you can uh, get this done. Okay. So, in case, so that was a fraction of uh, features that Corio provides you to uh, fast track your application development. So all these, on top of all these, we follow, we encourage or we 
help developers to follow industry best practices when uh, developing the application. So uh, domain-driven design, cell-based architecture, zero trust, uh, principle of 12-factor application. So all these things are, uh, so Corio is designed and developed in a way that you can easily follow these principles. So uh, Lakmal is doing a session tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m. under Solution Architecture Track. So you can get a very detailed information on these domain-driven design, cell-based architecture, and zero trust. So I recommend you to go and have a, a look at that session to get more information on these technologies or other principles. Uh, if you're building cloud-native applications, it's, uh, it's good for you to have some idea of this literature. Uh, to make sure that you are doing application development in the correct way. Uh, so takeaways, building software for the cloud. We understood it looks like a complex task. And you need to have a very sophisticated platform uh, that should be able to support these initiatives within your, uh, within your organization. But building such a platform is going to take uh, um, uh, some amount of time and resource as well as uh, skills are going to be needed. So Corio is developed uh, to empower your developers with a comprehensive set of features that helps you to accelerate your cloud-native application development. Uh, and again, it's de designed with best practices. Uh, so we encourage developers, so we enforce sort of developers to uh, develop the applications in adhering to these best practices. So as Sanjeev mentioned in his keynote, so uh, with Corio, let Atlas do his thing and let your developers focus on more meaningful work on like building more business critical applications and infra infrastructures that is required for the business rather than focusing on developing the platform itself. Cool. So um, yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about during this session. So if you have not tried um, Corio so far, I encourage you to go and have a look so you'll feel how much thought we have put into developing this platform, how easy we make you to develop uh, applications or expose your APIs through Corio. So I truly hope that you give it a shot. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, 